I'm one of those who follows a very, very basic principle that if you can't say your piece in less than 10 slides, frankly, it reflects the failure of the clarity of your thought process. Unfortunately, this time around, I've had to add two slides relating, relating essentially only to the Sri Lankan case to build my argument. Otherwise, there would have been still less than 10 slides. Okay, so let me move on to the first slide very quickly. There again. Now, it's fairly obvious. There is nothing wrong with borrowing. As long as you're creating assets that generate the returns either directly or indirectly through economic and commercial activity, generates the revenues, and you can actually service your debt. Well, that's fairly obvious. Now, of course, in our case, part of the problem has been that we have been funding wasteful, unproductive expenditures and low priority, poorly you know, selected and designed projects. The reality today is that the servicing of the external, and in my opinion also the domestic debt, which I'll come to later, looks increasingly unsustainable. Now the gross public debt uh, is 667% of revenues, the average being 214% for more than 20 comparative countries. Now this, these numbers have come directly from a presentation made at the, pre at the PSD conference in Multan by Sayyid Ali Abbas of the IMF. Our external debt is 232% of exports, and average is 64% or more than 20 comparators. Actually, uh, the numbers are much higher now in our case, uh, but I have deliberately not used them. The prospects for recovery now, frankly, depend essentially on the extent to which we can bring you know, our debt to reasonable and manageable levels. Now, which means also the prosperity, uh, sorry, the maturity of the debt, and of course, the cost of the debt. What are the possible options to renegotiate contracts? That's the key question. That's the key question. Now, the issues, frankly, vary enormously because you have the issue of the foreign currency debt swaps. There are deposits with the central bank of China and the Gulf countries. They might argue that they have first right simply because that was never any debt in that form. So, and this is on the principle of seniority. The second issue is that a lot of these commercial bonds, in fact, all of them without exception, where there are a large number of bondholders, they are covered legally under the New York laws. So to be able to even access some kind of legal relief, the chances tend to be fairly limited. So what am I saying? Debt restructuring will be a complex, no shortcut solution, no quick fixes. And the example is before us, there are more than 30 countries seeking debt relief in severe debt stress. And only four to five have actually tried to get debt relief, and it has been more than one year for the negotiations to be continued. I can tell you. These are numbers I'm just sharing. The most important one is really the number on gross public debt, debt which is important because when I discuss the Sri Lankan case, this will become relevant. Just sharing these numbers. And the breakdown of external debt, as I said, the numbers are more current. There are 28 billion, I won't go into details. The category and ratios for external debt, Agit Aligari. 66.5 billion, more than 50% of total, was added in the 1990s and between 2008 and 2018. I'm grateful to Dr. Ashfaq Hassan Khan who provided this number in the PSD conference in Multan. The average repayment period is about 6.5 years. In, two, in 2023, last year, 20.8 billion was actually spent on, on repayment and on interest charges. If you only look at the portion of the public debt, that was close to 18.7 billion. So compared to 50, 
So that was 58.6% of exports of goods and services. Who are our creditors? I think these are important again from the point of view of what we will see in the case of Sri Lanka. 44 to 50% of our debt is due to multilateral. It depends on what the level of debt was, the time period in which you're working out these ratios. Now, most of the debt of these multilateral is really at highly concessional rates. And they are treated as, under the present scheme of things, as preferred creditors whose debts cannot be rescheduled. The share of the bilaterals is roughly 31%, excluding deposits, as I said earlier, with State Bank uh, of uh, China and the Gulf countries, and the swaps, swaps of the State Bank, which is approximately 8 billion, both of them. Okay. Of which the debts of the Paris Club members, which does not include China or the Gulf countries, was rescheduled in 2001 to and it is repayable in the second half of the 2030s. The remaining debts are about 20%. 22% of the maturity is less than one year, 32% between two to five years, and 22% more than 10 years. Terms and conditions of the Chinese loans, unfortunately, are not fully transparent. So far, the Chinese have been rolling over the debts, uh, very reluctant to take any losses. Come I'll also refer to them later. Another complication in the case of the Chinese is it's not very clear what is bilateral and what is commercial because some of the financial institutions which are publicly owned are be, could be treated either as bilateral or as commercial. So that's the other confusion. The work done by Aid Data, good work done, it's been reported extensively in the media, so I won't refer to it. Um, more recently, share of the energy-related loans was 40% and 30% for general budgetary support, as was the case in our case. 60% of the more recent borrowings have been for budgetary support. Um, and so the budgetary support referred to as uh, rescue lending by data, which was essentially uh, you know, rescue lending more of the Chinese creditors of Pakistan. So essentially they were lending, and what they have done is, and the details are not available, that they have a set of loan repayment safeguards of which details are not available for the rescue lending. You know, the impact of COVID-19 on low-income countries, the war in Ukraine, the global environment for higher interest rates, there is growing recognition amongst multilaterals, bilaterals, that the low-income developing countries under stress need to be assisted in some form, providing debt relief, uh, which may even involve some kind of a reduction in the face value of debt. The G20 Common Framework for Debt Treatment has actually brought all these creditors together. The purpose is fairly straightforward, so that disputes, disagreements can be settled internally, and you know, better credit co coordination will enable to settle and resolve the issues in a timely and a meaningful manner. To date, only Chad has actually sought relief under this uh, initiative. Uh, this initiative, I repeat, is for heavily indebted countries. Negotiations are ongoing when it comes to Zambia and Ghana, and uh, this has been going on for more than a year. Sri Lanka, which was earlier an upper middle income country, and by the time the crisis came, they had been lowered to a lower middle income country like us, did not qualify under the, this framework. So if they didn't qualify, they, they got their relief under a separate arrangement altogether. Now I'm just wondering whether that would also apply in our case or not. Other countries were reluctant to get into this arrangement uh, and, and seek uh, some kind of relief. And the reasons were the pain that would, may have to be taken, and I'll come to that pain part, which is the more important one later. And second, they were afraid of the downgrading of the credit ratings, which will, which will mean that they will lose access to international financial capital markets. Now, because I mentioned Sri Lanka, it's important to look at the similarities 
In fact, when I started digging, I, I found that fascinating. So I brought together all the similarities in Sri Lanka, and they're quite, I mean, it is unbelievable. I mean, I just never realized it. It had a higher per capita income than South Korea in 1960. Sounds familiar, huh? They gave generous tax exemptions, expenditures, you know, running wild. They had a primary surplus in only three years since 1951. The result is all before us, huge fiscal deficits, uh, which in the year before the crisis was 12.2% of GDP. Financed, of course, by foreign and domestic borrowings, and the public debt had become 128% of GDP. Interest payments were about 72% of their revenues. The external debt was, uh, and the domestic debt were both roughly the same. Uh, so 128, you can split it equally. They are now in the 17th IMF program. They had 16 before this. Each time the program didn't last very long, some stability came, but the efforts to, uh, to address the macroeconomic balances, frankly, were never sustained. Sound familiar again? The central bank supported fiscal indiscipline. Our case, Nadeem, 12.8 trillion on the 22nd of November, which was 12% of GDP. Support to inward looking import substitution, the favorite of Nadeem, and I can see <laughs> Mazur, and very low levels of investment. In the last two to three years before the crisis, investment levels were less than 7% of GDP. Ours is 13 now. They had an overvalued exchange rate. And so money was, of remittances were flowing through informal exchange markets. So a parallel market had been created. And of course, the domestically protected industries were resisting any timely adjustments in the exchange rate. They had given, like us, long-term exemptions of income tax and import duty made no difference to the levels of FDI. External borrowings, external reserves are built essentially on borrowings. Again, sounds familiar. Frequent policy reversals and, and supplemented with ad hoc policy interventions. Again, very, well, I found that fascinating. Frankly, I had never looked at Sri Lanka. What happened after the default? They defaulted in end of April, early May 2022. They owed seven billion at that time, reserves 1.7 billion. 28% of their debt was owed to multilaterals, 31 to bilaterals including China. In their case, 41% of their debt was commercial loans. The interest rate was roughly 7.5%. And the China debt share total was about 20%. Negotiation with the IMF uh, began in 2022. The important thing of the IMF is that you have to be under an IMF program to qualify. Okay? I'll come to that in a moment. All lenders, and that's the important part, were asked to take a 30% haircut. All lenders, including domestic debt providers. The progress has been very slow. Uh, still no assurances of debt restructuring from China, uh, sorry, uh, from Japan and India. And of course, um, none of the bondholders. Even after this, this restructuring, the IMF said that the debt will be sustainable at 95% of GDP. Please remember that. And the interest costs still look unsustainable. Four to five billion a year, 5% of GDP. That's the estimates of some of the, the Sri Lankan economists. Recently, the China ex Export Import Bank, like in our case, has reached a, de a deal on China related debt, but frankly, no details are available. After the fund programs, there was some progress on reforms. Inflation has come down to single digits. The availability of essentials has improved, but frankly, unaffordable to a large segment of the population. In fact, 
uh, you know, a fairly sizable proportion of the middle income families have slipped before the poverty line, below the poverty line. Youth and skilled personnel are desperate to leave the country and 311,000 less left the country in 2022. So looking at the global initiatives, there have been some proposals which requires that all these, like in the common uh, uh, framework, all creditors, lenders must come together. Um, but the debt sustainability analysis has to be conducted by the IMF because they are perceived as the ones put in a far better position to assess debt sustainability. Um, which means that you have to be part of the IMF program. So that's one. There is a talk of a fair set of rules. The rules expect an equitable treatment of all creditors based on the category of the creditor, the maturity profile, and more importantly, the uh, cost of debt. Um, Okay, all consistent with the IMF's debt sustainability analysis, commercial lenders continue to charge high interest rates for the risk premium. But you you charge a high premium but are still insisting to be paid in full. I mean, I often even wonder if those, all the creditors that we have, including multilaterals, continue to lend to us, knowing the way we were behaving uh, they should be ready to now to take a hit because that, that was the quality of due diligence. In our case, it's, it's obvious that they would that relief to have to be provided. And in the case of the multilaterals, if all countries have to be provided relief, they will, their capital will have to be injected into them by donors and so on. The important thing, which is what I come, want to come to very quickly, is all those seeking debt relief. Re restructuring, reprofiling, whatever you want to call it, will be expected to present a very comprehensive set of reforms. You know, and they will have to show where the debt restructuring fits into the scheme of things. Perish the thought that somehow we will get debt relief and we can continue to operate and conduct our business as in the past. They would want debt relief, they want to see a demonstrable commitment that there is no return of the conditions and the crises uh, which brought the country in the first place to seek debt relief. The kind of, so I won't go through them, that's the possible sec you know, set of reforms that I've proposed. Rationalization of government expenditures, I can go into details on that, I won't. Several agencies, would have to be, in my opinion, wound up. Forget the bloody privatization. Most of them can't be privatized. They, won't, they have to be liquidated or wound up. And then go on about how you retire people who completed 30 years of service. If they can't be retired, put them in a surplus, to at least save on rent, utilities, vehicles, and so on and so forth. Um, surrender all vacant, and I can go on, but I won't. And of course, uh, we have to look at the defense strategy, non-combat expenditure, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, we've been upgrading post simply because we've been adding our officers. Huh? So, where the brigadier is needed, there is a lieutenant general. Typical government as well. So, please move on. Um, no additional projects in PSTP. No intra-provincial projects and parliamentary development schemes, and so on and so forth. Treat, in my opinion, treat us suck investment where you actually spent 20% so far. Write the bloody thing off. You're far better off, far better off. Because most of that is any, in any case on salaries, vehicles, and utilities. Reduce the footprint of the state. Uh, a lot of work has been done by PIs and so on, which is distorting markets, excessive regulations. Most of it, in fact, I was, when I was the finance minister in the Punjab in the prehistoric times, I had argued for heaven's sake, regulatory framework ka, there are only one or two areas where you would want to look at it again. But all others, I used to argue, and I, of course, didn't last very long, seven months, my argument was a very simple one. Rescind all regu regulatory laws in anyone, if anyone feels that this law needs to be there for regulations, please come, present us and convince us that this is required. 
Think it's okay. So let's just say to hold one to the ability of German policy. And just give me um, ten seconds. And the reason I mentioned that is government carry hoti hai ki yaar we are always firefighting. Hame ye nahi pata subah kya hoga. But then you're expecting the private sector to take a long term view. The signal from the government is we can only take a short term view, which is essentially one week. But you expect the private sector to take a long term view. Think, okay. Fair out heavy protection to industry is the favorite of some of us. Uh, rationalize import tariffs to make the economy competitive. Like you revamp tax structure. Don't tax income. Uh, sorry, don't tax transactions, tax income. And actually, please lower the rates of taxation. And so on and so forth. I won't go into those structural reforms. And some of the reduction in the external debt, frankly, will have to be uh, included and complemented by capital controls for a short while. Uh, not easy, uh, not desirable, but that will be the case. Final, final, very quickly, um, I refer to, oops, where is it? Uh, as I said earlier, the Sri Lankan case also demonstrates very clearly, if you want some adjustment in the external debt, they would expect a similar sort of adjustments at the level of the domestic debt. Interest on domestic debt now is 90% of the interest payments that you make every year. So you can, banks being the largest borrow, uh, lenders to what I would say in quotations, a bankrupt borrower uh, uh, will have to take the hit. Now, what would you do? There is perhaps a combination of interest rates lower than the rate of inflation. Inflation will not take care of the ability to service the debt. I'm not talking about period of time. Uh, it will require uh, external re repayments to be extended uh, and domestic repayments to be extended. There will be, have to be some suspension moratorium on interest payments for some time and, and perhaps even write down of this face value of debt. Now, substantial reduction in the face value of debt will require the capital base, base, base of banks to be improved. The recapitalization will require two things. One, a relaxation by the state bank of its potential regulations on the capital adequacy, and perhaps a lending by the government of Pakistan at concessional interest rates to be repaid, or the government of Pakistan actually injecting capital, taking non-voting shares as shareholders, like some of the OCD countries did over a period of time, over a period of time with the profitability of ba banks improving, they would be able to sell their shares, actually get the money back and perhaps some return on it as well. To check a run on the banks, uh, frankly, uh, heavy, we will have to have heavy, heavy penalties on cash withdrawals and some kind of uh, government guarantees for deposits over a certain period. The fifth or sixth worst option, well, that's one option if you don't want to do anything, tax the banks heavily. Not desirable, but that's the way it is. In conclusion, I may be being a little unfair, uh, but my sense is that the general perception is that yeah, we can't service your debts, so I have a debt relief there then, so that we can go back merrily to the ways that we've been running our affairs. Frankly, that ain't going to happen. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Huh? They would want us to change behavior. Think um, more of the same is no longer an option. Now, of course, pain will have to be administered. My fear is that the distribution of this pain will be such that the pain will be, f and the burden of this adjustment will be borne disproportionately by the less affluent segments of society. Now the test of leadership and the challenge for the leadership would be how to ensure a more equitable distribution of this pain of, on different socioeconomic classes based on their capacity, ability, and capability to bear the cost of this and to bear the burden of this adjustment. Thank you very much.